last three years here on The Journal, we've looked into every aspect of the film industry from a customer standpoint. But as someone who's literally seen his local cinema avoid death and secure a multi-million pound refurbishment, there's a whole plan that I think James can do to ensure the survival once, well, all of you have been jabbed. Since the initial shutdown last March, every cinema has been trying to formulate a plan to restart successfully. They've all struggled. And I think I might have a bit of guidance to help him in the right direction. Because if you're going to restart, you got to restart properly. It's a plan that I reckon will bring cinema closer. And that's the thing that we've been shouting about from the rooftop since we relaunched everything on New Year's Eve. So, presented in this little video essay of sorts for this month's journal, here's how I think the chains should go about running things. We'll start with the price. Now, we got to get as, as cheap as you can possibly get. This is the biggest complaint about the industry nowadays, and with some places going for the higher tier pricing, <coughs> Odeon Leicester Square, <coughs> it's something that we really need to look at as a, as a collective. People don't want to be paying around 10, 20 pound a ticket anymore. We've got to be looking at more liberal, like five, 10, 15 at the absolute highest. We've got to get people through the doors. To put this, into perspective. Let's go back 20 years in terms of statistics. We say 20 years because, of course, 2020's average ticket price simply doesn't exist. In 2000, the average cinema ticket price was around £4.40, and over the years it climbed up to a staggering £7.49 in 2017, which is just as the recline has started to roll out around the UK cinemas. From that point, it slowly started to decline. 2019 was £7.11. But you can make the case that with the arrival of all these fancy new technologies that we'll get onto a little bit later on in this episode, it's understandable that the ATP has gone up at the behest of the cinema chains and the sheer amount of money that the film distributors are demanding back from cinema guys for watching their films on the big screen. Once you add in the metric of the multiplex cinema infrastructure itself and how that's grown over the last 20 years, you can understand where this price increase came from. Let's give you a apples for apples comparison. 2008, according to the UKCA, 276 multiplex sites, which are one site with five screens or more, were operating in the UK. Ten years later, there's 395 of them, with just over 3,524 screens. So you can sort of understand the thinking of the studios here. Plus, in an extra little argument with the whole pricing of concessions, the average annual spend of a UK cinema goer, going back to 2005, because again, that's the latest I can get the stats from. 2005, the average annual spending head per population in pounds was £12.93. These are how much they expect the UK population are spending on average on things other than the tickets, your concessions, your drinks, your food, all of that kind of thing. And then it, again, slowly but surely, it starts to creep up. At 2015, we break the £19 barrier for the first time, reaching an all-time high of £19.35 in 2018, just at the peak of the self-service concessions, the arrival of the Odeon Lux site, and, of course... But then it went down in 2019 to £18.72, and this gives you, this next stat gives you, your first indication as to how hard the industry has been hit by COVID. Because last year's average annual spend per head was under a fiver. Buy your concessions, folks. We really need it more than ever. Just as important as the price is the seat itself. You don't want to be paying through the nose for a crappy 1980s era setup. Over the last 10 years, many re-gears have been going on across the big three. View and Odin have been pursuing those recliners, and Cineworld have been going, well, pretty big on 4DX. What a stupid gimmick. But we've got to get the basics right. We're talking comfy seats with enough leg room to ensure distancing if we ever need it again between guests. You've got to balance that little control between comfort and feasibility. You've got to get as many people in but make them feel as comfortable and as safe as you can. Why do you think 
recliners have become the big thing nowadays. You've got that home comfort, the premium upsell opportunities, and the bloody comfy. Now, the technology. I'm pushing for 4K projection as the absolute standard, because obviously, we're also talking 7.1 surround sound at a minimum with Dolby Atmos in the bigger screens. If you want to get people through the doors, you have to give them tech that outweighs what they have at home. Now, I can easily get nerdy about technology for days. We literally did a whole journal episode in series two all about 3D cinema and its long and tenured history within this fantastic industry. But things have changed quite considerably since then. Technologies like 4DX have arrived, which are movable seats, something that Cineworld have doubled down on, especially with their ScreenX system as well. God, I can smell an overpriced gimmick when I see one. To the arrival of 4K ultra high definition laser projection screens like the iSense ones that Odin have been doing, or even the reclining seats that we mentioned a little bit earlier on in this episode. The cinema technology aspect is something that the chains should not overlook. It's just as important as the films you have on screen, especially after a year of watching movies predominantly at home. You've got to up your game in terms of the three S's, the seat, the screen, the sound. Netflix has been great with Dolby Vision, HDR, and all those acronyms across the board. But we have to get the three S's right. It's obvious. And I know laser projection is becoming more and more commonplace in multiplex venues. I know Cineworld have been doing a mass rollout at some of their sites in America and a few here in the UK as well. View are still pretty committed to Sony, even though Sony aren't making digital cinema projection anymore and Odin have been going all in on their iSense offering. I want to see a good balance between premium large format and decent to mid-sized screening rooms that give you perfectly EQ'd sound, decent seating and really good pitch quality. And yeah, a lot of people have invested in 5.1 surround systems during lockdown, but they're great, but they're not quite as big if we're going to do a big screen, we've got to do it properly. 7.1 at a minimum. Dolby Atmos object-based surround. So literally, sounds coming from the roof. They have evolved the technology and it is time for cinemas to put the money where the mouth is and actually invest in this stuff. When my local was refurbished five years ago, I was stunned that Atmos was not part of the specification. We got very good 7.1 surround sound, but I was surprised that screen three or screen six did not get Atmos put in because that would have got butts on seats. And the final point is a big one for me. The staff. They are always the beacon within a multiplex or independent cinema. They're literally the first people you see as you go in and the last people you see as you leave. The staff are a very important element of the experience that are very frequently underlooked and underappreciated by the higher-ups. They play a valuable role in not just bringing cinema to the community, but in general, bringing cinema closer. They are the beacons of a good day or a bad day at the office. I should know that. I've been doing this for 15 years and I have had many stories with cinema staff over the years. A lot of them I legally can't tell because they watch this series. Hello to the team. Importantly, you've got to have staff who give a damn. It's easy to tell who knows their stuff and who is there just for the comps. I've been very fortunate enough to see a whole generation of staff come through my local cinema's many, many roles. A lot of them are still my closest friends to this day, even though they've moved on to legal roles, teaching, and in the ultimate role reversal, actual film production. But you have to have staff who are knowledgeable about the industry, who give a damn about projection who know the product that are coming in, ideally watching all of the product as it comes into the cinema, whether it's with customers in screen as it comes out or at early screening opportunities. 
I mean, like we don't mention the fact that staff shows exist. Staff are ultimately the voice of cinema, more so than the critics, because at site level, they are the, the guide. So they have to know what the films are about. They have to know the BBFC ratings for these films. And importantly, and this is the big, 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 big bit, they have to get the presentation of these films right. You don't want to have to walk in on a screen check and see Tenet being played twice as loud as it should be played. <laughs> And that has been a common problem with the way multiplexes are run. As I say, I've been quite fortunate in that my local multiplex have consistently got presentation right time and time again. Because if they, they know, if one foot out is out of line, I'm going to make some noise about it, whether it be to their gen general manager or on the feedback forms. Get on that, folks. Feedback helps the industry. One last point before I do head off and it's an underlooked aspect, is the design of the cinema foyer itself. It's arguably, alongside the staff, the most important bit. You don't want to walk into a cinema and have it reek of the 1990s. I've been there, I've done that, I've bought the t-shirt, and I got the refurbishment. But cinema needs to rethink the core offer. You've got to have the best of both worlds. They call it gamification. That's the, that's the buzzword for it, apparently. But cinema needs to look beyond what goes on on screen. You have to look, rethink the off-screen offering as well. And that's where your concessions come in. Things like the preview bar, which is a new concept that V have been rolling out at their refurbished sites over the last couple of months. The Odeon Lux offering, like the Oscars bar, the self-service concessions. Even Cineworld's extravagant foyer design that echoes very similar to what Warner Village did in the mid-1990s, the sheer amount of lighting that they put into them. That is a modern foyer. You've got to have it looking all shiny and new and I know I'm not on about spending millions of pounds just a simple freshen up here and there a good clean a repaint hell even a couple of digital posters here and there for good measure you've got to make people get the impression that you are in a state of the art venue why do you think view don't call themselves a cinema chain anymore cinema is more than just a film it's about a premium out-of-home experience that you can't replicate anywhere else. But importantly, as cinema comes out of COVID, we need to start getting the basics right that little bit more. Not just in terms of getting the usual safety protocol right as we come out of all of this, but importantly, we need to be getting those core aspects of the experience, the seats, the screens, the sounds, the cleaning, the staff. We need to make sure that people feel comfortable enough coming back to the big screen after, in some cases, nearly a year of full-on absence. As more and more of the world comes back online, we need to really refocus our efforts in terms of the cinema exhibition experience to remind people what they have been missing out on while COVID has run wild. And sure, the release schedule plays a big part in that, the studios have to stop arsing about and moving films with like two weeks of notice. That's got to end. We have to start putting movies out again. Because if movies don't come out to the big screen, we're going to lose cinema exhibition altogether. It's already started with Warner and the whole day and date release strategy. And while most territories do have access to that, the UK doesn't. The UK still has to play by the theatrical window, which is now just 31 days. So, great British public, I'm going to put it to you. Do you want the big screen to thrive? Or do you want them to become a relic of the past? When they're open, use them or lose them. I know I will be. And with that, that is this month's journal. A bit heavier than usual, but... Um, had to get it off my chest with the restart. Uh, for full disclosure, I'm recording this about a week and a half after the roadmap 
was announced because uh, we're filming a big chunk of journals well in advance just so we have content ready for the restart hopefully by the time you see this we will be in a position where cinemas are open <laughs> and on top of that uh, we've got some cracking plans in the works for Series 3. Um, not the Series 3 we wanted to deliver back this time last year, but um, with Yukon going the way of the walrus, uh, I'm glad I'm out of that place. Uh, join us back here next month for another episode of The Journal, but until then, my name's from Jack Smith. This has been the flagship YouTube series from, from ejacksmith.com, and until then, we'll see you at the movies. Rugby time! Wonder how poorly say we're gonna play this weekend. Packer, Pogo, Pencil, Pronger, Pintle, Piston, Pizzle. Wait, what? Wiener, Wanger, Wilfred, Weenie, William, Winkle, Weasel. Dodger, Member, Johnson, Peter, Sausage, Blackfoot, Shizzle, Dog, 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 Dog. Call it what you want, but when it stops working, Make the right call. Do something mm. about erectile dysfunction. What the actual... I mean, we've had it all on, on rugby. Adverts for this, and this, and this. But playing an advert for erectile dysfunction in the middle of a BT Sport game. Wow! Celebration too.